I want to say a few words about the video that we're going to watch today. Uh, when we don't have class in 100 Thomas because I'm out of town, the stream team uses one of the hundreds of videos of past classes as material for the day. So I am out of town, and hence we're not live. Uh, but the video that you're about to watch is actually from another class, one that often meets before Social 19 in 100 Thomas. And on this particular day that this video was recorded, our team arrived early to capture footage of that class because we thought it was important. I was in the audience. So we've been waiting or wanting to show this video uh, of two Social 19 students because it's relevant for all students at the university. It's the story of the death of Tim Piazza, a fellow Penn State student as told by his parents, Jim and Evelyn Piazza. Tim tragically died as a result of a deadly mix of hazing, alcohol, and the neglect of the young men who should have been looking out for him. So first I wanna say something to my current students. You might imagine that you'd never find yourself in the situation that Tim and the fraternity members were in and that this would never happen to you. But what we know about group think and group pressure is that this can happen to just about anyone. For those of you who are watching and who are adults, what happened to Tim can happen to any young person. As much as universities try to provide guardrails to young adults who are going to test limits while they're here, we sometimes fall short. We can't police every moment of every student's life, nor does anyone want us to. Drinking is such a large part of the U.S. college experience, and students are adults after all, that the best we can do is provide guidelines enforce a growing list of rules, and apply penalties and punish those students who break those rules. Of course, not all students drink, and the majority who do manage to drink responsibly most of the time, and some all of the time. And I should add that the students who don't drink are very often turned off and angry at having to engage with the drinking culture. And while the events that took place in this video happened in a fraternity house, those are spaces that are monitored by the university, and fraternity and sorority students have to participate in alcohol awareness seminars. It's actually the off-campus gatherings that are not sponsored by or connected to Greek life that can actually be most problematic. I can't say enjoy the video, but I will say that if you know somebody, who's headed off to college in the next few years, you might consider having him or her watch it. We're fortunate enough to have Jim and Evelyn Piazza here today. As most of you know, uh, they're the parents of Timothy Piazza, whose life was cut short due largely in part to an alcohol-fueled initiation ritual at the Beta Thai Pi fraternity house here on campus just two years ago on February 4th, 2017. Uh, and because this is a class where we talk about alcohol, and as you all know, we're usually talking about just how people use alcohol over the world. I've told you that as the class, as we get closer and closer to the end of the semester, we'll start focusing more on U.S. cultures, college drinking, sexual assaults, and all of that, the dark side of alcohol and what it can do. And so they're here today, and I'm, thank you so much for coming. Um, so let's give, them a, let's give them a welcome. First, we just want to thank everybody for, uh, for coming to hear us today. Um, we normally make presentations throughout the country, and normally they're about hazing. Um, but uh, when the professor asked us to, uh, to come here to talk about alcohol, I said, look, we're not alcohol experts, although we learned a lot more about it over the past two years than we ever wish we knew. Um, but we felt compelled because it is Penn State, and there is a special place for us here at Penn State and, and we want a great college experience for everybody. So we figured what the heck, we're gonna, we're gonna give this a try and, and see how we can do. Um, how many people here are seniors? <clears throat> so Tim would have been a senior and he would have graduated this year. Did anybody, anybody know Tim? Okay. 
Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try not to make this about hazing, as I said, although hazing is going to come in a little, a little bit here and there. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Tim, what happened to him, um, the effects of alcohol and the misuse of alcohol, and then some things that we're going to ask you to walk away with and, and, and hopefully do for us, do for yourself, do for your friends to keep things a little bit safer. So with that, I'll turn it over. Okay. So I just want to tell you a little bit about Tim and tell you the kind of person that he was. He was an amazing person with an incredible sense of humor. He was shy until he got to know you, and then he was larger than life. He was smart, athletic, loved Netflix and video games, and he kind of had his life figured out. He was going to major in mechanical engineering so he could have a career designing prosthetics, go to grad school, marry his high school sweetheart eventually, and just have fun with his brother and friends. So this is a picture of us at the uh, Rose Bowl in January of 2017. Uh, for those of you that remember, the Rose Bowl was on January 2nd that year because it fell on, uh, January 1st fell on a Sunday and we competed with the NFL. January 2nd happened to be our anniversary as well. Anyway, when uh, Penn State beat Wisconsin in the Big Ten Championship game, Tim uh, texted us and said, hey, uh, I'd really like to go to the Rose Bowl. And I was like, all right, well, it'll be a lot of money, but we'll, you know, it's California, it'll be a good break, we'll go for a nice week vacation, you guys are on break. And he said, well, we can't really do that. Um, I said, well, why not? And he said, well, December 31st is New Year's Eve, I have to be with Caitlin, I need to spend time with her, um, she's at another school, I can't leave her alone on New Year's Eve. And I said, uh, okay, I get that, so we'll just, we'll pack on the time on the back end. And he said, well, I can't do that either. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because I have this internship and they're gonna need me back at work. And meanwhile, this kid's between his freshman and sophomore year, I don't know how much he really need an intern, but so I, I gotta be back by Wednesday. And I was like, so wait a second, so you wanna fly out on, on Sunday, the day after New Year's Eve, so January 1st, and you wanna basically fly home on Tuesday. That doesn't give us a lot of time in California. It's gonna be very expensive. And he said, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, and he wasn't a kid that asked for very much, so I went along with it. It cost way more money than I would have liked to have spent, but it's the best money I ever spent because that was our last picture together as a family. Tim was a part of his girlfriend's family. He was the big brother to Caitlin's younger brother and sister, and he was there for them if they needed him or wanted him for anything. He was loved trusted and appreciated more than he knew. They were and are still devastated by his death. And Tim was a big guy who took on the role of protector of his friends or of anyone who needed it. He was a great friend, brother, and boyfriend. He brought lightness to any room, making people smile and laugh. My favorite picture is the one to the right. That to me is pure contentment. They truly were perfect for each other. So, you know, one of the reasons we're, we're talking about Tim so much um, is because Tim is just like all of you. He could be any one of you, any one of your siblings, any one of your friends. So as we go through this next part of it, think about it being you or a friend of yours or a sibling of yours. Um, we want you to feel it because hopefully when you feel it, you will make better decisions going forward. So let me set the stage um, as to what happened to Tim. On February 2nd, 2017, which was 30 days after the Rose Bowl, um, Tim received a text message telling him to report to his fraternity house by 9.30 p.m. wearing khakis and a blazer. He was told not to be late and that they were gonna get him fucked up. Once he got to the house, he and the other pledges were greeted with a small ceremony and they were handed a handle of vodka and were told that they had to finish it before moving on. Simple math would tell you that on average, each pledge had about three and a half shots in a matter of minutes. After finishing the handle, they were lined up behind the door and one by one, they were allowed through the door where they encountered a drinking obstacle course with several stations, which included beer shotguns, wine bag stations, vo more vodka, a beer pong challenge, and, and other, other drinks along the way. Um, they were being screamed at and pushed uh, and more beer chugging uh, was happening as that was going on. And then the, the obstacle course was followed by a so-called celebratory event in, in the basement of the fraternity house where the pledges were handled more vodka, handed more vodka, I should say, more wine bags and beers to drink. 
Um, you know, it was, it's interesting in that it was captured on video. It's the only time, as far as we know in history, that the, the a whole situation like this was was captured on video, which is why it's played out nationally so much. Um, but anyway, so after all this, uh, after all this happened, somebody brought Tim upstairs because they knew he was noticeably drunk. Um, and it was about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, problem is they left him alone. Um, so he actually tried to leave the house and, and get out the front door, but he couldn't figure out how to open the door to the fraternity house. Um, so then he went back towards the uh, basement of the house and he fell down the stairs. And uh, he was unconscious at the bottom of the stairs. His head was, was tilted and, and um, arched against the, the bottom of the stairs. Four guys were seen carrying him up. His body was limp, and they threw him on a couch. Throughout that night, <clears throat> they, uh, they kind of threw beer on him. They slapped him. They punched him. They threw shoes at him. Um, I guess figuring they would get him up. There were some people that knew he was seriously hurt, and they tried to get the others to call for help. Uh, but no one called for help. Um, in fact, uh, one person was essentially assaulted and thrown against the wall. I'm sure it's not news. You probably have heard about it. Um, and was told he better, he better not uh, call for help and he better just shut up. So long story short, nobody called for help for Tim. Um, he vomited and, and, and uh, was, was having convulsions um, throughout you know, a good portion of the night. And then finally, most of the, uh, well, actually everybody else went to bed or left the house. And they left him downstairs by himself to, I guess, sleep it off. Um, during the course of the night, Tim came in and out of coherency. Uh, he walked around the house. He fell down a bunch more times. Um, and then he went back to the basement steps, and that's really the last time anything was seen of him in the video. He was found the next morning um, unconscious. Uh, his body was stiff, um, fetal position, uh, very difficult to move his, his, open his fingers or his hands, move his limbs. Um, they carried him back upstairs. And for about 45 minutes, they talked about, all right, well, what do we do now? This is clearly a problem. Um, I think one of the quotes is, uh, he looked fucking dead. Um, but they waited 45 more minutes. Um, finally, they called 911. Uh, 911 came. They never told 911 about the fall, um, about any of the injuries. Uh, they just said he had, he had been drinking a bit. Uh, so then he was taken to the hospital, and uh, from there I will let my wife take it. So who here has a brother or sister close in age to you? close enough to be in college at the same time. If not, consider your best friend and consider that you're both going to the same college. Now, close your eyes and imagine that your brother's pledging a fraternity and it started last night. You get a call from your brother's roommate saying he didn't come home last night and that's not like him. He always comes home. You decide something's wrong and call the hospital to see if he's there. They say, yes, there's been an accident. Come right away. You rush to the hospital and see your brother on life support, neck brace, bruises and blood on his body and head, eyes half open. The doctor tells you it's bad, that he has a subdural hematoma, which is bleeding in his brain. His spleen is ruptured. He has a punctured lung, and he needs a blood transfusion because, as it turns out, 80% of his body's blood is in his abdomen. You have to call your mom to tell her that the doctor's going to call but that your parents need to come right now. You tell her what little information you know, that it was the first night of pledging and that he fell down the stairs. They need to medevac him to a trauma hospital one and a half hours away, Hershey Medical Center, you, for, for neurosurgery immediately. You talk to him even though he's unconscious. You tell him to hang in there, that you are proud of him and that you love him. A tear rolls down his cheek you think he heard you, and then they take him away. Now, picture your mom and dad getting that phone call, as well as the call from the ER doctor. The doctor says he's a very sick boy, but they don't understand what he's hinting at, that their son is dying. It doesn't click. Both mom and dad have to drive 45 excruciating minutes to get home, to pack bags, and then drive over two hours to get to the hospital where he'll be having surgery. 
Your dad says, this better not have anything to do with that fraternity. And your mom tells him, it was the first night of pledging. They call the police to find out what's happened. There's not a lot of information, but they say he fell down the steps once, maybe twice. They get to the hospital and feel sick when they see the helicopter still sitting outside. They rush in and have to wait in the surgical waiting room. Finally, someone comes to take them to surgical ICU to meet with the surgeons. It turns out this man is a chaplain, but they don't know why a chaplain was sent to get them. It doesn't click. In a small room, a surgeon and a nurse tell them that their son's brain injury is non-recoverable. They feel the world stop. Another surgeon comes in and says that once the skull was removed to release the pressure on the brain, the brain kept swelling outside of the skull and that this is considered brain death. They try to comprehend what's happening. He's brain dead? How can this be? He's still on life support. Is there any hope for recovery? No. They have tests to prove brain death, but they can't be done because of his other injuries. You get a ride with your roommate to the hospital and find out how bad it is from your parents. You try to be the strong one. His girlfriend comes with her dad. They have to tell her that the boy she loves is brain dead. You all cry together. Then you finally get to see him. The only skin showing is his shoulders. He's covered with blankets to keep him warm, but his body won't warm up. His head is covered with a white gauze stocking cap to cover the bandages from having his skull removed to release the pressure on the brain from the bleeding. And he's got bruises and swelling on his face. He's on a ventilator. There are IVs everywhere and machines monitoring his oxygen level and body temperature. They need to put chest tubes in his lungs because his oxygen level is dropping. They think he aspirated on vomit. The doctors and nurses tell you that they are doing everything they can, but that it's just a matter of time. He's going to go into cardiac arrest. The organ donor person is talking to you about donating his kidneys, the only undamaged organs. Now, you have to decide, all of you, whether to resuscitate him when he goes into cardiac arrest, potentially breaking ribs in his already battered body, only to know that he will go into cardiac arrest again? Or do you let him go into cardiac arrest and die so they can take him into an operating room to harvest his organs? Or do you turn the machines off now in an operating room and let him go so they can harvest his organs immediately? You, your parents, his girlfriend and her dad decide to turn the machines off, but he codes before you can tell the doctors and they resuscitate him as you watch from the hallway. A nurse pulls your mom forward and tells her to kiss her baby goodbye. He goes into cardiac arrest again, and you all let him go. You and the 10 medical personnel in the room who look at you with sad eyes. And there it is, he's dead. It's 1.23 a.m. A day and a half ago, he was alive and happy. How did this happen? How did we get here? What happened to that fraternity house? This doesn't make sense. He was a good kid. He wasn't a risk taker. He wasn't a drinker. He was a good student. He had a longtime girlfriend who he was planning a future with. He had great friends and roommates. He had plans for his future at school and for his career. What happened? He was an amazing person who was hazed with alcohol and then ignored, tortured, and left to die because the fraternity didn't want to get in trouble. Think about this being your loss. Think about this being your pain. Think about having a funeral, having your brother cremate it, and having to watch your mom put his urn in a niche at the mausoleum. Think about you losing your best friend, your only sibling. Why? Because he was hazed with alcohol. Everyone's lives are forever altered, and there will always be this hole in your heart because he was hazed, got seriously hurt, and no one was willing to do the right thing and call for help because they didn't want to get in trouble. <clears throat> so a couple of things I, I want to mention. Um, I know I mentioned uh, the, the passing of the, the vodka handle um, and three and a half drinks in just a matter of minutes. Um, throughout the night, 
it, it was determined that uh, on camera, Tim had about 18 drinks in less than 90 minutes. Uh, you'll see in a bit that that is just out of control levels of drinking. And again, we talk about it because what happened that night is a direct result of alcohol. Um, the other point I want to make is, you know, we talk about fraternity and we talk about hazing, but we are not anti-Greek life. Um, we just, again, we go around the country talking to fraternities and sororities to try to make things safer. Um, so for those of you that are in Greek life, this is not an attack on you. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, alcohol, obviously, you guys have learned a lot about it over the, the course of uh, this semester. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's often used recreationally. Um, it, uh, it could lighten your mood, it could relax you, it could decrease anxiety. I mean, I'll have a drink, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not immune from it, so I will have a drink. Um, in small doses, uh, it, you know, it certainly can relax you and ease your tensions, but it's also uh, accompanied as you drink more and more, it reduces your inhibitions. So your, your, your ability to stop yourself from doing something that you know you shouldn't um, is kind of diminished. Um, your coordination kind of falls off, your reaction time to things falls off, all of which puts you at risk, which is why there's drunk driving rules and, and uh, even, I believe, riding a bicycle um, when you're drunk is, is against the law. Some of the other uh, social effects of, of alcohol use and abuse are unprotected sex, pregnancies, um, sexually tr transmitted diseases, date rape. Um, and these are prevalent things on a college campus. Up to two-thirds of the date rape cases involve alcohol. As I said, it could change your behavior. It changes the way you think. It, it can make you loud. It can make you belligerent, um, offensive, uh, cause you to get into fights. Um, it will just change the way you interact with people um, if you drink too much alcohol. Um, there's, there's situations where you can end up being in a, in a place where you become a victim um, because you put yourself in the wrong place. Everybody, I am sure, has heard about the, the young girl from New Jersey uh, that went to the University of South Carolina who had been out partying at 2 o'clock in the morning. She called for an Uber. She got in the wrong car and uh, she got killed. That happens. That's reality. These, these things can happen from improper use of alcohol, and that's why we're here today. Um, so we encourage everybody to, to drink in moderation. Um, you know, a, a low level of, of drinking is, is okay. I mean, obviously there's underage drinking rules. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, you know, we're not here to preach that. All we're suggesting is, is, is moder moderation. And it, once you start deviating from moderation, you, you make yourself susceptible to alcohol abuse and addiction. Um, individuals should, should limit their alcohol intake to no more than four drinks per day or 14 per week. Um, that's for men. And for women and uh, those that are over 65 should have no more than three drinks a day and seven weekly. Um, once you go beyond that, you start crossing the line of, are you getting into the abuse area? In college, look, we're, we're, we're realistic. We know Penn State has somewhat of a reputation as, as a party school as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a higher risk of, uh, of abusive drinking. And, you know, hopefully those of you that, that thought of taking this class think twice about that. Um, but, you know, on a college campus, uh, abuse of alcohol puts a higher risk of, of hazing situations, not only in fraternities, but in sports groups and, and marching bands and clubs and spirit groups and all that, and also increases the likelihood of sexual assault, as I said. College, and this is an interesting fact, college students spend more money on alcohol generally than they do in their textbooks. And I know how much textbooks are, because I'm still paying for textbooks, so. Um, We've also learned about half of college students who drink consume alcohol through binge drinking. Um, that's somehow in vogue, um, and, and it, it should not be. Um, and then one in four college students experience negative academ academic consequences from drinking. So again, there's impacts to you. And then, you know, there, then you get into alcohol abuse and uh, disorder, alcohol use disorder. Um, that comes with drinking alone. Um, 
It could result in problems at school, at work. Um, you'll have cravings for alcohol, and if you do, that's when you need to start seeking help. Um, if you start feeling withdrawal symptoms from, from drinking alcohol, uh, you could have financial problems because, again, you're spending a lot of money on alcohol instead of food, um, you know, your schoolwork and other things. You could have health problems. It damages your liver and other organs. Um, if you start lying about how much you're drinking, you need to step back and think, why am I lying? Why am I not telling the truth about how much I'm drinking? It's because maybe there's a problem. Um, and then, as we well know, alcohol can kill. Um, about 1,800 college students uh, die from alcohol-related injuries every year. Each year, approximately 5,000 people under the age of 21 die as a result of underage drinking. This includes about 1,900 deaths from car accidents, 1,800 homicides, uh, 300 suicides, and hundreds of other deaths due to accidents like falls, burns, drownings. I know people who, uh, we live near the Jersey Shore, um, who have gotten drunk and thought it would be cool to go swimming at night at the Jersey Shore and never made it out. Their thinking was impaired. It's not a good idea to go into the ocean, at least in New Jersey, where there's heavy waves and undertow, when you're drunk and it's, and it's light, it's dark out and you, people can't see you. So. We ask you to take that into consideration. Also, um, a lot of deaths are just a result of alcohol poisoning because people don't know how much they took in or asphyxiation, they swallowed their own vomit. <clears throat> so use of hard alcohol, that, that seems to be you know, the alcohol of choice, um, especially as it relates to, to, to hazing situations. Most of the deaths that occur as a result of hazing situations are from alcohol. We usually have a slide up with all the deaths that have occurred over the past uh, 20 years or so, and most of, almost all of them are alcohol related, and there's a lot of names on that, on that list. Um, you know, mixing is another common situation, especially uh, in coerced type of situations where Individuals are, are given um, all different types of alcohol, um, you know, hard alcohol, beer, wine. <clears throat> First of all, they all interact with each other, um, and normally it will make you sick to your stomach. But also, you don't really know then how much you're drinking because you don't know, uh, you know, did you have uh, an amount of wine which can, is considered one drink or two or three drinks? Did you have a shot? that is considered one drink, two or three drinks. So you really don't know when you start mixing all these alcohols how much you're having. Um, and then there's the quantity. I mean, when you're using handles and wine bags and um, chugging from a keg and things like that, you really don't know how much you're taking in. Um, we'll see on, on tables in, in a little bit uh, what, you know, how your blood alcohol con uh, concentration goes up and, and how it comes down. But um, you know, the, the important thing that I want everybody to walk away with, binge drinking, I guess it seems to be in vogue, but it's not a good thing to do. You're putting yourself at risk. Your friends are being put at risk. Your siblings are put at risk. We don't want anything to happen to any of you, your friends, or your siblings, like what happened to our son. Um, the other thing is that alcohol abuse is often a gateway to... Uh, to other abuse and addictions as well. And again, we, we would like to, to see that stop. The NIC just recently um, put a ban on uh, hard alcohol, the North American Interfraternity Conference. They did that because they realized that most of the deaths and, and harmful situations are created from, from hard alcohol. Um, so it's important to, to, to to be mindful of how much intake you have when you're drinking. Um, a high number of college student situations that end up in the hospital are, are as a result of binge drinking. So again, we ask you to be mindful of that. So this is a chart just to show you what a standard drink size is. So for a beer, it's a 12 ounce beer. A glass of wine is five ounces. A cooler, and I don't know how often wine coolers are in vogue anymore. They were years ago, maybe not so much now, but that's 12 ounces. 
Um, a shot is one and a half ounces, and spirits are like one and a half ounces. Um, the, the alcohol content is also like a beer is four to five percent, cooler four to five percent, wine ten to twelve percent. A shot and spirits are forty percent alcohol, which translates to eighty proof. And it's customary, well, customary beverage serving sizes in restaurants and bars don't necessarily conform to standard drink sizes. So a mixed cocktail, for example, may contain the alcohol of three different standard drinks. So you're getting a lot of alcohol at one point. And then there's grain alcohol. And I know that this was big in college when I went to college. And I remember hearing about you know, grain alcohol punch in a trash can. And grain alcohol is a clear liquid with no color, smell, or taste. However, it does have a harsh aftertaste, according to consumers. It can burn the throat and even lead to coughing. Um, sometimes grain alcohol is purified to the point that it's used as rubbing alcohol. So it's, you're essentially drinking rubbing alcohol. Uh, a popular brand of grain alcohol is called Everclear. And it's 95% alcohol content, which is 190 <clears throat> proof. It is one of the purest and most potent alcohol beverages available. It's so dangerous that some states have outlawed its sale and consumption. And just as a side note, um, Max Groover died from hazing uh, September 2017 after Tim. And we are friends with his parents now. And what they gave him was something called diesel which was 190 proof, and they made him chug diesel. At his time of death, the day later, when they took his BAC, he was like 0.495, and that was after he was already dead. So that just goes to show you that you need to stay away from grain alcohol, because it is just dangerous. So, like I said, Everclear is more than twice the proof of most standard hard liquor. The liver processes about one serving of alcohol an hour. Binge drinking is four to five servings of alcohol in a two hour period. With around two servings of alcohol consumed per hour, the liver gets backed up and more alcohol enters the bloodstream. So if one shot of Everclear leads to about a 0.08% BAC, three servings can cause alcohol poisoning. And this just shows you various BAC levels and what the effects are on you. And a BAC stands for blood or breath alcohol concentration. It's the amount of alcohol in the bloodstream or on one's breath. And so if you have three to four drinks in an hour, you most likely will be over the legal driving limit. And it will probably take five to six hours for your body to process that and get back down to 0% BAC. Four to six drinks, the brain begins to experience the effects of alcohol. Judgment and decision-making abilities are impaired. Person's reaction times will get slower. They'll feel lightheaded, woozy. But the person's likely to remember events. Eight to nine drinks, it's much worse. Reaction times are very much slowed, speech slurs, vision may change, you might have double vision, loss of focus, and a hangover is likely to set in. At 10 to 12 drinks, coordination is severely impaired and the risk of an accident or personal injury is very high. So taking that back to Tim, they served him 18 drinks in an hour and a half. That's, this is just pointing out to you how bad it can be. More than 12 drinks, alcohol poisoning is likely. Breathing, heart rate, and your gag reflex can all change. And alcohol is absorbed through the stomach lining. It's absorbed directly into the, breast, the bloodstream. Food will slow down the absorption, as well as diluting alcohol with wa uh, water or juice. But if you mix it with something carbonated or drink it straight, you will absorb it faster. And doing a BAC calculator 
you can find them online. I guess it's a formula that they didn't want to explain. But um, just for example, a male who is 200, 200 pounds who drinks something 80 proof, which would be vodka, and has five drinks in an hour, that is a 0.11 BAC. And it will take seven hours to get back down to a zero. And then this BAC chart is used for estimas, estimation. So just to look at the side, the number of drinks, it's broken out male and female. And the top is body weight. And the number of drinks is actually a poor measure of intoxication because the variation in physiology and individual alcohol tolerance. And the variation exists with respect to body weight, sex, and body fat percentage. Uh, generally, men can handle alcohol better than women, and it's because women are usually smaller, have more body fat, and have a lower total body water content than men. Just a little comment about <clears throat> BAC, a little anecdote. Um, a few weeks ago, a, f a partner of mine flew up from Atlanta. He was in town visiting, and he called me up. He came over our house. Uh, and we opened up uh, some wine, and we were having wine. As I said, I, I have drinks. Um, so we were drinking some wine, and I don't know, we probably got to talking about Tim and, and everything that happened with him. And I had remembered that uh, my wife had bought me this, this keychain. It was a BAC um, indicator. Never used it, never had the need to use it. So we actually broke it out um, as we were drinking the wine. And we blew into it at, at different stages of the night. And at one point, I realized, you know what? My friend, who wasn't staying with us, can't drive home. Um, and it wasn't that he was showing terrible signs of intoxication or anything like that, but he had clearly too much to drink to drive. So he ended up having somebody come pick him up. Um, so your, your BAC goes up uh, very quickly. and. Um, you know, you need to be mindful of that, especially when you're, when you're drinking a lot very quickly. Um, your BAC is going is to go up not as quickly as you intake it. So if you have six drinks in, in, in a matter of minutes um, or, you know, even 15 minutes, um, say six shots, your BAC is going to continue to rise over time. Um, and then how do you get the alcohol out of your system? Well, that's, that's your metabolism, and, and your metabolism is going to break down the alcohol. Um, the alcohol is metabolized or broken down out of the body at a rate of 0.016% per hour. It doesn't matter if you're 6'4 or 4'6, if you drank red wine or diesel or whatever else. <clears throat> your BAC is going to reach a certain level. No matter, no matter how it got to that level, your, your body's going to need time to break it down. Um, and remove it from your body. Um, people try countless ways to eliminate the intoxication, to eliminate the alcohol, such as uh, um, drinking coffee. Um, it'll make you feel more awake, but it doesn't get you more sober. Your BAC stays the same. Um, eating food, drinking a bunch of water, um, exercising, none of that is going to make you more sober. It may make you feel a little different. You are still going to be as intoxicated. You are still going to uh, make the bad decisions. Um, so don't think you could uh, you know, drink water or drink coffee to sober yourself up. You could end up going to bed at night and wake up intoxicated in the morning, um, and there's just nothing that you can do about it. Um, your, your body can essentially get rid of one drink per hour. Um, otherwise, you know, the, the alcohol is waiting its turn to eliminate itself from your body. So again, be mindful of that. When you, when you hit it hard and when you pregame, your blood alcohol content is going up quickly, but it's not going to break down as quickly as it went up. So the effects of the abuse of alcohol and binge drinking Number one, you drink heavily, you're going to have a hangover. And it, it feels terrible for anybody who ever has one. Headache, sensitive to lights, sound, nauseous, maybe vomiting. I don't know if anything can make that feel better either. Anybody here ever have a hangover? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> um, and then it can also lead to depression because alcohol is a depressant. You may think that it makes you feel good at the time, but it depresses the whole body. So after a certain point, you may reach a level of anxiousness and sadness and emotion. You also have an increased risk of injury. You can fall and incur a traumatic brain injury that could be undiagnosed and masked because of the perceived effects of alcohol and as well as damaging your organs. So in Tim's case, they fed him all these drinks and then he fell, which was a logical result of having so many drinks. And then they pretended like, maybe pretended isn't the good word, but they said, well, how, did, how were we to know we thought he was just drunk? Well, he did fall down the steps and was unconscious. So you have to be aware that these are results that can happen for you or anybody around you. Vomiting is really too much poison in the body. You can have severe dehydration from vomiting too, which can lead to dangerously low blood pressure and a fast heart rate. And for me, vomiting is like my kryptonite. I'm good with an open wound, nosebleed, I can handle that. Tell me you feel like you're gonna throw up and I lose feeling in my arms. So I was one of these people that I would not even drink to that point of feeling sick because I didn't wanna to have to make bargains with God not to throw up. Um, now, I'm going to reverse blacking out and browning out just because blacking out says so much. So blacking out does not mean that a person becomes unconscious, like falling asleep. And unconscious is, is not falling asleep, by the way. Instead, people continue to interact. You could do routine things, you can, and you can continue to drink. People who black out may drive themselves home engage in sexual encounters, destroy property, spend too much money, uh, choose other risky behaviors. And people who are blackout drunk are more likely to physically injure themselves. They've been known to walk home, brush their teeth, eat meals, go through normal behaviors, but they don't remember these behaviors because their brain doesn't move those experiences to memory. Once the person begins to sober up, the brain will begin to process memories normally again. But if blackouts become a common occurrence, the brain may have a harder time developing memories and retaining them. So heavy drinking can basically cause irreversible brain damage. And it is possible to pass out while experiencing a blackout. A person who's exhibiting unusual risky behavior or who passes out while drinking needs medical attention to prevent alcohol poisoning and 911 should be called. Experiencing a blackout after drinking does not mean that a person has a substance abuse problem, but it does mean that they drank more than their body could process over the course of a day or an evening. People who often complain about memory loss or blacking out after drinking are more likely to have alcohol use disorder, indicated by the fact that they consume alcohol on a regular basis, not that they experience blackouts. However, people who black out frequently from drinking too much are also likely to have a higher tolerance to alcohol. So their BAC will often be higher than a 0.15 when they experience a blackout. But people with a higher tolerance, um, a BAC of 0.2 will generally lead to a blackout. And this is ex extremely dangerous or life-threatening because alcohol poisoning begins at basically 0.3. So you're closer to alcohol poisoning when you're in a pattern of blacking out. Your, your tolerance goes up, and now you're closer to a dangerous level than you realize. Some people may experience brownouts, and I had never even heard of this until we started researching this. While a blackout is a failure to remember several hours that take place before the person's blood alcohol content drops, a brownout involves failing to remember some events, but not all. And things may come back to you when somebody suggests something and may trigger the memory. Alcohol poisoning is due to a large quantity of alcohol in the body. The individual may suffer seizures due to the amount of alcohol. Drinking too much too quickly can affect your breathing, heart rate, body temperature, and gag reflex, and potentially lead to coma and death. 
and you can consume a fatal dose of alcohol before you even pass out. So you need to know the signs of alcohol poisoning. And it's a cute little, it's a good little tool on the right hand side. Um, if you suspect that someone has alcohol poisoning, even if you don't see the classic signs and symptoms, seek immediately immediate medical care. And in an emergency, like follow these suggestions. If the person's un unconscious and can't be awakened, breathing less than eight times a minute, has repeated uncontrolled vomiting or has seizures, call 911 immediately. And keep in mind that even though someone's unconscious or stopped drinking alcohol, alcohol continues to be released into the bloodstream because your body can only process one drink an hour. So it's just sitting there waiting to be absorbed. And the level of alcohol in the body continues to rise. Never assume that a person will sleep off alcohol poisoning. When you call 911, be prepared to give information. If you know, be sure to tell the hospital or emergency personnel the kind of alcohol the person drank and when. Don't leave an unconscious person alone. And don't try to make the person vomit either. Because at that level, alcohol poisoning affects the way your gag reflex works. And that means that someone with alcohol po poisoning can choke on their own vomit and accidentally breathe it back in and aspirate. And that can also cause a fatal lung injury. However, do help someone who is vomiting by keeping them sitting up. And if they can't sit up, if they're lying down, turn their head to the side to help prevent choking. And try to keep the person awake so that they don't lose consciousness. And alcohol poisoning can lead to death in less than an hour. So there's a procedure that we know um, called how backpacking. Many know, how many know what backpacking is? Yeah, Honestly. backpacking, jan sporting. Um, it's, it's commonplace and it is like the procedure that people use for people who they think have drank too much. And for those of you who don't know, it's when you fill a backpack with heavy books and you put it on somebody's back so that they won't roll over onto their back and choke on their vomit. But the thing is, like I said, at a certain level of intoxication, your body shuts down. The epiglottis doesn't work, the gag reflex doesn't work. So the vomit comes up, but it's not propelled out of the body. And you will breathe it back in. And you essentially drown in your own vomit. So don't backpack. If you're thinking about backpacking, if you're checking somebody's breathing, if you don't, if their color of their skin looks blue, if you know, you're checking their pulse, call 911. I think we're going to skip the uh, aftermath. Okay. Um, some other considerations. So <clears throat> when you're drinking or when you are giving drinks to somebody else, what you don't know, what you don't think about often is the medications that you or someone else is taking. Those medications can exa exacerbate the impact of the alcohol. So again, be mindful of it. Um, you know, not knowing one's limit. You know, people come into college, a lot of them never really drank, or if they did, it wasn't very much in, in, in high school. Um, if you put that person in a position where they're all of a sudden drinking a lot of alcohol, they're going to have, uh, they're going to get to that dangerous point much quicker. So please, you know, be aware of that and be aware of it for yourself as well. Um, again, you know, failure to make reasoned decisions. Um, <clears throat> don't exert peer pressure on others to, to drink with you or to play a drinking game. Um, you know, sometimes people like to walk away when they know they've had enough, but then the peer pressure brings them back in. Don't do that. You're putting them at risk. Um, if somebody has family alcoholism in their past or addiction in their past, again, you need to be mindful of that because that could happen to you or your friends or your, or your siblings. Um, don't drink and drive. Hopefully that goes without saying. I think knock wood, that has changed a lot since we were younger. Um, but even if you're drunk and you're, you're walking around campus, you could walk into the street and get, have a car hit you. So again, it's important to, to be able to keep uh, an awareness about you of, of what's going on around you. And then there's the legal ramifications of, <clears throat> of drinking and underage drinking. And I'm going to do this very quickly. But in Pennsylvania, um, furnishing alcohol to a minor is a third degree misdemeanor. You don't want things on, like this on your record. It could get thrown out of court. It could get what is called an ARD, which won't go on your record. But a lot of cases, if you're furnishing alcohol to a minor, you could get charged with, 
with a misdemeanor, which comes with a potential sentence in jail, um, a $1,000 fine, and then if you do it again and again, a $2,500 fine. Um, suspend the driver, driver's license for 90 days could go up as you continue to go forward. And again, you'll have a permanent criminal record. Um, and if you get out of it, you only got out of it because you paid an attorney a lot of money. You don't want to spend your parents' retirement money um, paying attorneys for you because you got out of hand. Uh, underage drinking comes with its own consequences. Um, I'm not preaching here. You do what you want, but um, it's a summary offense. Um, $500 uh, fine for the first offense. Again, driver's license suspension. Uh, and again, something permanent on your record. You could get out of it if you hire an attorney, but again, you're spending your parents' money and that doesn't make sense. And then there's the consequences that come in at the university. The university has its own set of consequences that you'll have to abide by. So Pennsylvania now has better medical amnesty as, as it relates to alcohol. So if you believe that, well, if you're calling on someone else's behalf and you believe you're the first to call, you identify yourself and stay with the victim until help arrives. Both of you, both you and the victim will not be charged with a crime relating to underage alcohol consumption. And the point is, you should always err on the side of caution and call for help. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up. Um, we're gonna skip over something we were gonna do, but here's what we ask of you. Um, you took this class, I don't know why you took it, but it's actually an interesting class to me. Um, we made the time to come here because we care about you guys. Um, so we, we couldn't leave here without asking something of you. So we ask you to obey the law. Um, again, if you're gonna underage drink, we're not preaching, but you know, do what's right. Be mindful of your own state and that of others. Um, if you've had too much, cut yourself off. If your friend had too much, cut them off. Don't put peer pressure on them. Um, don't pressure anyone to drink. You could be putting them in a dangerous state. Know the signs and stages of intoxication. By all means, don't backpack, it doesn't work. Um, there's an individual that died at Lafayette University, not from hazing, um, just heavy binge drinking. They backpacked him, he died. Um, don't let someone sleep it off. Call for help. Don't be a bystander. You could save someone's life. You will be very happy if you did that. And I can assure you, if you knew you had the opportunity to and you didn't and somebody died or got really hurt, you'd be very sad and upset and you don't want to live with that. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to add a couple of things uh, that I wrote down in regards to some of the stuff you were saying, but um, talking about how being mindful of the alcohol content of something and how different it is, where most whiskeys and most spirits that you buy, yeah, they're 40% alcohol, so they're 80 proof, right? Um, but a lot of them, like, like Wild Turkey, right? Wild Turkey 101, that's 101 proof, that's 101 proof, right? So that's six, that's uh, 50, it's 50%, 50 percent, 50 percent yeah. alcohol. Now the thing is, the reason I brought it up is that Andrew Coffey, yeah. which is a, was a student at Florida State, um, he died the same year uh, that Timothy did in 2017. And he had, he consumed and was required to consume an entire bottle of Wild Turkey 101. Now, there are 25 shots in a, in a bottle, in a, in a 750, in a, in, a, in a fifth, right, a normal bottle. There's 25 shots. But that's, 20, that's 25 shots of alcohol based on a 40% alcohol, an 80 proof. This is 100. This is the equivalent. He, he had the equivalent of 44 shots. His blood alcohol, 0.558. It's, but it, that's about, I mean, drink, okay, drinking a fifth of anything is a bad idea, okay? I mean, that's stupid. But the point is, this is looking at these alcohol, and the same thing with um, Groover, with drinking the, the, uh, the Everclear, right? And so, but the, I know, another thing I wanted to bring up, too, um, we were also talking about just alcohol-related deaths. Um, 
And this has nothing to do with hazing, but it has to do with a situation involving lots of alcohol that get out of hand and you end up doing some things that you might not have normally done if you were sober. And we don't know all the details yet, but I needed to bring this up. Um, so the, the, the student that got shot and killed in Philly over the weekend, Nick Flacco, he was in this class. Oh my God. And I just found this out from his good friends that are in the ROTC. His funerals today, I'm not saying he was at fault or I don't know what happened. I know that they were tailgating and everyone was drinking and things got out of hand and they got into a, an altercation. That's all we know so far, but alcohol was involved. And this is one of, one of the people in this classroom. And I just found that out uh, on Tuesday. So anyway, I mean, you know I am not against drinking. I just all, and this is not, and they're not against Greek life. It's just watch out for each other. Like, just pay a little bit of attention to what's going on. And that really is hard to do when you're drunk. And I'm not saying don't get drunk either. I'm just saying, like, think about things just a little bit differently, right? That's all, that's, that's all, you know? Um, anyway, that's all I had to add. But I would like to open this up to some questions, right? We have these wonderful guests that are here, and I'm sure some of you have questions. So if you do, where the TAs are on the edges with, uh, with mics. Do we have anybody that has questions? Oh, we have one right here. Here, I'll share. I like this. There you go. Um, so I was just gonna ask, do you, I know that our laws in PA have gotten better for amnesty and stuff like that, but um, do you think that in some states or even PA, uh, like the safe harbor law and stuff should be more broad, protecting more people than just the person who calls. And because the way the law is worded in this state, if you don't meet all four of the criteria, you and the person that you called for are not protected at all. So you have to do all four or it's no bets. Uh, so for example, if you're at an apartment party and someone is you know, sick, you have to get everyone out of the apartment and all that time that you're spending before you call the police could be like crucial minutes. So um, it's a good question, and I know that there's, they struggle with, with that, not only here in Pennsylvania, everywhere, because then you're just letting everybody else off the hook. But what I can tell you, and unfortunately, again, we spent way too much time with uh, prosecutors and university administrators and whatnot, if somebody makes the call, um, nobody's looking to throw a bunch of kids in jail or, or you know, throw out a bunch of fines. Maybe they'll make you take the class. You know, but um, all they want you to do, they want somebody to pick up the phone and save that life. And it is very, very unlikely, although I can't promise you, but it is very unlikely that everybody else in that party is going to get um, ticketed or, or, you know, brought up on a misdemeanor. So I get your point, but if, if that's going to hold somebody back from making a phone call to save a life, think about, think about that. That's crazy. You don't, don't be that person. Yeah, I'm wondering how many of you out there would be that person to get in trouble if, the, if you knew what the outcome was going to be, like with Timothy. If you knew what the outcome was going to be, of course, there's no way to know that, but you don't know what you might be stopping, right? So just, and I know it sucks because it's like you, nobody wants to get in trouble, right? And you're drunk too, and so you're thinking, I don't, this is a bad decision. And sometimes there's other drugs that are there, right? You know, there might be... You know, I don't know, from pot to coke or whatever. I don't know. There could be all sorts of stuff there. It's like, well, we don't want to get in trouble, so we're not going to call. Just call. I mean, there's getting in trouble and there's dying. So, I don't know. The police are going to worry about getting the, the hurt person to the hospital. That's what they're really going to worry about, not what everybody else is doing. Yeah. And you also have the blue light system here. So, you can take the person to the blue light even if you don't want to make the phone call, but you should make the phone call. Uh, would you say that since what happened to Timothy, if you think in general, if events like those huge frat parties with lots of binge drinking and hazing and underage drinking, do you think incidents like those have gotten better since then and they're happening less and less or have they gotten worse? Well, um, 
<clears throat> so, was it yesterday we were here? No. Two days ago, we were in uh, Belafonte for uh, a sentencing hearing for four of the individuals uh, in Tim's case. Um, if anybody's paying attention, three uh, got jail time and one got house arrest. Um, but when we were there, the detective that, that did most of the work on the case was there. And I asked him, I said, well, how are things on campus? And he said, um, it seems like things have calmed down quite a bit. They're not perfect, um, but they've calmed down quite a bit. So I'm hopeful that uh, people are listening and paying attention um, and being a little bit smarter. I think it's going to take time to change uh, behavior and culture, but um, I, I do think it's getting a little bit better based upon you know, validation from uh, from the detective based upon some validation I've gotten from President Barron. Um, but you guys probably know better than me if it's gotten better. And that's here. But already in 2019, there have been two hazing deaths and one more that just happened last weekend that's under investigation as a potential hazing death from Georgia Tech, a football player. One of those was because of alcohol and forced consumption. One was sleep deprivation and we're thinking the one last week was a physical thing. So it's still happening in terms of hazing and fraternity parties and, and initiation. Hopefully it will slow down. Which is why schools are having us come and talk to their students. They're, they want that message to get out. Well, she's doing that. The one thing you, you, you touched on something, and I meant to say it earlier, is, is a lot of times when you're drinking and you've had too much, and, and I've experienced this in my own life with some of my, uh, with some of my own friends, um, you know, you get this bravado about you, like you could take on the world, and um, um, it may have happened with, with the Flacco situation, and I'm so sorry to hear that, you know, he was part of this class and even this university. Um, but I've, I've been in situations where my friends got this bravado on with, with other people, and frankly, they got their, their, their butts beaten in um, by, by people because they just they thought they could take on the world. So it, it's not a smart thing, especially if you're intoxicated. Your reaction time is, is slowed down. So you know, somebody's throwing a punch at you, you're not going to be able to react to it as quickly. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, just after everything that happened, why aren't you guys against Greek life? I'm sorry, what was that? After everything that happened, why aren't we against Greek life? Why are we against Greek life? No, why, uh, why, why, why are you not? Yeah. Do you want to answer? Or well, we could both answer. Um, well, it's, first of all, hazing is not just Greek life. It's in marching bands. It's in spirit groups. It's in sports. I mean, how many times over the past year have we read about high school sports? And apparently in high school, because they don't have hard alcohol at their disposal, they're using things like broom handles and sexually assaulting people. Um, so it's happening everywhere. And we've seen Greek life work. We know people, other parents, who, like the mother of Max Groover, she was in a sorority, loved it, was never hazed, didn't even know anything about it. Um, we've seen it work, we've seen good things happen, good groups. I can see how it would be your network for the rest of your life. You know, these are friends, these are contacts for business. So it is possible to have a good experience. You just need to eliminate the hazing from that. Yeah, I mean, my first reaction was take it down. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't in Greek life. My first reaction was take it down. Um, and I thought about it, well, you know, it'd be pretty hard for me to take it down by myself. But, um, you know, I, I am all about networking, in, especially in a business career. Um, it's so important, and I do see the, val the validity of being in Greek life from a networking perspective. But, but I, I've spent a lot of time with leaders from, from national Greek organizations and a whole lot of time um, with the individual who runs the North American Indo Fraternity Conference and the woman who runs the National Pan Hellenic Conference. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're my strongest allies right now in what we're trying to do, this crusade we're going on. They don't want the bad behavior any more than we do. Um, so, you know, I said to them, I said, look, if you screw me, I'm going after you. But um, they, have, they have far from done that. They have been uh, so in line with everything we are trying to accomplish because they want the same things. They, 
They want Greek life to thrive, and they want people to be safe. Nobody wants 18 to 21 year old students dying or getting hurt and going to the hospital. Nobody. And these, um, I mean, initiations are important, right? From, from a cultural anthropological standpoint, they're extremely important, right? It's a ritual or ceremony from when an individual moves from one group to another, right? There's a transformation that happens, a bar mitzvah, but getting your hair cut in the military. I mean, all these things are, these are these, these rites of passage that you go through, and they're important. And there's even evidence that shows that um, th there's a level of what's called cognitive dissonance that happens in this, where people that go through those things together, they have a tighter bond with each other because they went through that, right? And so it makes sense. But initiations don't have to be life-threatening. Um, all cultures throughout the world have some sort of rite of passage. I mean, some of them are as crazy as you could imagine. Um, but there's a group in Vinatu that does cliff diving. They, they, they dive off these platforms with, with rope, uh, vines tied around their legs. And then, you know, it's kind of like a bungee cord, but it's not a bungee. They do this when they turn 13. I mean, this stuff happens all over the world, but this is... This doesn't, there, there are different initiations, right? I mean, something has to happen. You're going through a big moment. You're joining a group. You're becoming a brother. You're becoming a, a sorority member. You're I understand, but it doesn't have to be, <laughs> it doesn't have to be deadly. Right. Um, it just doesn't. Yeah. And, and what we like to point out is this is a person you're choosing to be your brother or your sister. Trust. Yeah. This is not the way to start off a friendship is by you know, hurting, demeaning, you know, really damaging a person. That is not a good way to start a relationship. And people who are hazed, generally years later, they may not remember the names of the people that they were with in oh, college, but they will remember the name of the asshole who hazed the crap out of them and resent them for it. And we've heard about it, many stories like that. Yeah. Uh, what advice would you give to like someone who's maybe interested in joining a fraternity, learning um, everything that you've learned about what happened to your son? Good question. Um, well, for one thing, we're a big fan of deferred recruitment. Um, I think everybody who just comes right into college really needs a semester to be on their own and learn how to ha handle themselves. We've heard of something called the red zone, which is like the first six weeks, and it's when Freshmen go crazy because they've never been so unsupervised before. And, you know, that's where they drink and do whatever. Give advice. What? Give them advice. Okay, okay so. <laughs> so. Against the clock. Deferred recruitment. Um, like, listen to, to what you hear. Like, listen to what the conversation is, and, and you'll hear who's bad, who's good, who does whatever. Um, go to the Greek Life Office. They'll be happy to tell you which chapters are not doing well and have bad reports against them. If the school like this one now has a report card, um, check the report card and see what the violations are. Um, talk to your parents. So, so the one that I'm surprised you didn't talk about is if you're going to join a, an organization, Greek, any, any organization, and you're doing it with other people, make a pact. If they ask us to do something that's dangerous or that any one of us is uncomfortable with, we're out. And you know what? That's okay because they need your money. They're going to have to let you guys go. And I don't care. They'll yell at you. They'll tell you you don't come back. They need your money. So if you all walk together, um, you'll be back the next day, and it'll be a different feeling. So for me, that's the number one thing. Yeah. Have a pact when you go into it. We well, sincerely thank you, too, uh, for taking the time to do this. I know it's never easy. Um, I was a mess over here. Um, I, it's such a powerful message, and I don't know, just thank you so much for taking the time. You guys are rocks. I mean, like, to do this, you're rocks.